This area, and what happened here long ago, is what Maria hides behind the astral clock tower. This is the fishing hamlet, the third and final stage of Bloodborne's DLC. Beneath the surface, off to the left and the right, is the city of Yarnum. The nightmare we progressed through, from this perspective at least, resided beneath the Great Lake all along, which explains why all the patients in the previous episode heard the dripping, and the currents, and the rain. I went through the footage, actually, because I was curious, and just before the clock tower opened, both hands aligned on one of the many runes that line the edges of the clock. Guess which one it was? They pointed to a deep sea rune. It reads, This transcription of the Great One's inhuman voices depicts down-reaching currents. This rune means deep sea. Great volumes of water serve as a bulwark guarding sleep, and an augur of the eldritch truth. Overcome this hindrance, and seek what is yours. The truths hidden here have to do with the Bergenworth scholars, who violated this small fishing village long ago. Bergenworth. Bergenworth. Blasphemous murderers. Blood-crazed fiends. Atonement for the wretches. By the wrath of Mother Goss. Mercy. For the poor was a child. Mercy. Oh, please. There's a lot in this dialogue. Firstly, this inhabitant of the village had some interaction with the scholars of Bergenworth. The wretches, as he calls them, the murderers, the blood-crazed fiends, they did something to a child. And he calls upon the wrath of Mother Coz, whose name should probably be familiar to you, right? Ah, Coz. Or some say Coz. Do you hear our prayers? Clearly, she's a great one. As recommended by a couple of people in the last video, if you come here as a piece of cauliflower, then instead, the villager says this. Curse here, curse there. A curse for he and she. Why care? A bottomless curse, a bottomless sea. Source of all greatness. All things that be. Listen for the baneful chants. Weep with them as one in trance. And weep with us. Oh, weep with us. <laughs> so, what did those of Bergenworth do to warrant curses being placed upon them? It must have been pretty terrible. And the accursed brew reads, Skull of a local from the violated fishing village. The inside of the skull was forcibly searched for eyes, as evidenced by the innumerable scratches and indentations. No wonder the skull became stewed in curses. And this skull partly explains it. It sounds like the scholars of Bergenworth came to this little village and violated the inhabitants in the name of new discoveries. And it also sounds like the villagers called upon a great one to curse the scholars. According to the Moon Rune, the Great Ones are sympathetic in spirit, after all. And based on the way the Bergenworth scholars were violating them and searching them for eyes, clearly the villagers had had some interaction with the Eldritch Truth. So, the scholars were cursed, and so were their successors. The Hunters. At this point, I went back and I unlocked all the cells we found in Episode 1. Do you remember those? They were just past Ludwig. According to this key, hunters are held within the underground cells, so that things better left unseen, and better left unknown, will decay quietly. Within the first few cells, we find this church pick hunter. He drops the church pick, which is a sort of pickaxe crossed with a short sword or a spear type thing. And I also unlocked the door that held this guy, who was reciting something about being a true blade of the church. According to the wikis, his only purpose is to be killed and looted for his set, which names him as Yamamura the Wanderer, an eastern warrior who pursued a beast for honourable revenge, and then became a hunter of the league. The innermost cell belonging to the bell ringer remains locked for now. You hear this? Fear the bells toll. 
for only death awaits foolish prying eyes, and the church assassins are never far behind. Clearly there's more to discover, so now that the stage is set, let's play our part and get through to the finale. I love how this stage feels like an actual fishing village. They've done a great job with that. It's a unique location for a level as far as the Soulsborne series goes, and they do so much with such a simple theme. The fishmen are a dime a dozen, and I like how backstabs are actually a viable technique against them, unlike most enemies in Bloodborne up until this point. The fishmen attack in packs, and they serve as the standard enemy, but the real threat are the giant fish troll things. The most scary enemy, in my opinion, is the one that can outrun your player character, and just look at how this thing moves when I turn my back on it. It scared the shit out of me right there. Approximately 1,000 backstabs later, you learn just how difficult these things are. Maybe I should have used those obviously placed fire pots against it. Hmm. A note for next time. Hidden on the cliff face also is a path back to the ladder that was in front of the starting lantern. The player who pays attention is more likely to have checked for a hidden path back, which is a nice touch. And it is pretty worth it to look around all the time. Look at this thing. I noped out of here pretty quick. I didn't really fancy one of those things attacking me on a ladder. And I have to say, again, I really like the way this bit is designed. I only looked around because I started to hear the winter lanterns singing, and that's the kind of sound you want to watch out for, and it rewarded me by telling me there's a giant fish troll on the roof. You guys are probably realizing that I really like when games reward the observant player. I've probably said that a lot of times by now. So, this next thing that happened probably happened to all of you guys too, right? You start fighting one of the fish trolls and, you know, you convince yourself that other one on the roof isn't going to come attack me. That's not going to happen. And then you're about to win and you're like, hang on, what's that noise? God damn it. One of these things was tough enough, but two? I ran away and I got up the ladder just in time and I was going to plan my next attack. And then I fell in. Now, don't worry, I survived until I got out. And then I was like, I know, I'll drop those rope Molotov cocktails behind me. They can fall down ladders, right? And no, turns out they can't. And then I fell in again. And at this point I just made plunging attacks a part of my strategy. It didn't work, really. Eventually I just got good. And I realized to my surprise that one of them had dropped a weapon. It was the Rakuyo, which is Maria's weapon. It reads, Hunter weapon wielded by Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower. A trick sword originating in the same country as the Kanehurst Chikage. Only, this sword feeds not off blood, but instead demands great dexterity. Lady Maria was fond of this aspect of the Rakuyo, as she frowned upon blood blades, being a distant relative of the Queen. One day, she abandoned her beloved Rakuyo, casting it into a dark well when she could stomach it no longer. What a neat little story. Maria must have eventually given in to her desire for blood, as she certainly uses blood and self-sacrifice in her boss fight. How curious that she's related to Queen Annalise as well. I've got some theories on this, but it'll have to wait for Prepare to Cry. By the end of the playthrough, the Rakuyo becomes my main weapon. This is a skill build after all, using the Blades of Mercy, the Burial Blade, and not to mention this character actually looks just like Maria, right? I modelled this character after the doll ages ago, so yeah, who would have thought that that would pay off? It's cool to have a weapon that you can call your own, you know? I've been searching for one for a while, and mine is the Rakuyo. What's yours? You should let me know. In a hut further down, we find a lantern, and lying on the ground, dying next to that lantern, is Simon, the Bowblade Hunter. Who are you? I'm afraid I've made a botch of things. Oh, I can hear the bell now. The beast hide assassin. He's after me. Again. And again. It never ends. <sighs> Please. I need you to do something. 
This village is the true secret, testament to the old sins. It feeds this hunter's nightmare. Please, bring to an end the horror. So our forefathers sin. We hunters cannot bear their weight forever. It isn't fair. It just isn't fair. <sighs> Simon was one of the last sane hunters in the nightmare. He pushed us to go deeper and deeper into it, and with Maria gone, he seems like he decided to come forward himself and fight a little bit farther. However, there is another hunter here, other than Simon, someone who doesn't want anyone discovering what lies at the end of the nightmare. Bredor, the church assassin. The weapon he uses is the blood letter, which assumes its true and terrifying form after it draws upon blood from the inner reaches of one's body and soul. This is what it reads. This was the only effective method of expelling tainted blood. Also, Bredor, isolated in his cell, continued to believe. Well, well. Look who's here. Welcome to my quarters. I've never entertained a guest before. Are you going to kill me? After all you've done, kill me. As if to right your wrongs. <laughs> you get his weapon if you kill him but I kept Bradaw alive here because I wasn't sure if there was more to him, and sure enough he does invade you a total of four times throughout the rest of the stage. Once outside his cell, once on a bridge, once in ambush when you pick up an item down below, and once in a cave. Each time he drops a different piece of his attire, uh, the clothing has its own story as well. Turns out, Bradaw was a church assassin who or the beast hide of his former compatriots. The church gave him a bell that he could ring to hunt people down and stop people discovering their secrets. And we'll talk more about him later, but moving on. In the next section, I spied one of those mollusk things clinging to a post, and I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna let myself get ambushed by that thing. I still remembered how one of them fell on me in an earlier level, and then I was like worried about looking upwards and hundreds of them crawled out of shells and ambushed me and I felt pretty stupid. But seriously, do you remember that first one that fell out of the sky in episode one? It makes sense now, doesn't it? All along there was this world above us, we just didn't have the insight to see it. And how this one fell out of the nightmare itself is beyond me. But it's a cool concept to think that all of these nightmares are layered. Uh, it makes me think about the ship masts all over the ocean as we progress. Uh, think about it, you've actually seen these ship masts before. You can actually see them in the nightmare frontier, suggesting that there's water down there hidden in the fog, or perhaps that the nightmare frontier is even connected to this nightmare, but is even higher up. After all, in the first stage of the DLC, there's an amygdala corpse as well. Perhaps it fell out of the nightmare frontier as well. This is really speculation, but interesting to think about. To quote the Cosmic Eye Watcher badge, Here we stand, feet planted in the earth, but might the cosmos be very near us, only just above our heads? All of the Nightmare Realms are really high up, and they all have Great Ones residing at some of their highest points. Uh, land masses float in the Nightmare Frontier, with Murgo in his loft in the tallest tower. The Hunter's Dream is nestled amongst these arch tree looking things in the clouds, with the Moon Presence descending from above. And the Hunter's Nightmare is within a great ocean, below a grand lake of mud, and on the beach of said lake is the washed up corpse of a great one that was discovered long ago.
Born from this corpse is the Orphan of Koz. How curious that the Orphan's mother wasn't alive for the birth. It reminds me of how the Moon Presence must die for us to be born as a Great One as well. This is probably one of the hardest bosses in Bloodborne. The Orphan is insanely quick, he has a hugely varied moveset, and he even has a second phase where he evolves into a butterfly-looking thing. The neat little observations in this fight are that he's fighting you with the placenta that trailed out with him when he was born, and also that Mother Cos herself has a face. Turns out she's somewhat humanoid in form, just like he is. And I actually can't help myself. I start talking about gameplay, and then I get pulled back to talking about the lore again. I, I kind of figure that you guys are realizing how good the gameplay has been for the most part in this level. It's been an amazing stage, but let's just roll with it. Let's just talk about the story while I show you some of my failed fights against this guy. Specifically, let's talk about why our character is here, why we're doing all of this. We do have most of the items and dialogue now, after all. In the dialogue at the start, we learned that the Bergenworth scholars stumbled upon this fishing village and that they did some pretty terrible things. Not only did they violate the villagers themselves, as mentioned in the Accursed Brew description, but they must have also stumbled upon the Great One, Koz, or her corpse at least, which washed up on the shore, because they managed to get themselves cursed. The man at the start of the village, and even the woman speaking as you get pulled into the DLC, remember her? Both of them plead for curses to be placed upon the fiends, upon their children and their children's children, on man and woman alike. A bottomless curse, a curse forever true. And the Great Ones do have the power to curse people. According to the Defiled Chalice, uh, which is an item a lot of us probably have forgotten about, curses are, and I quote, caused by inciting the anger of the Great Ones. Additionally, according to the Moon Rune, as I've mentioned, the Great Ones are sympathetic in spirit, uh, so it's not crazy to think that a Great One may have listened to the inhabitants of the fishing village as they pleaded for the Bergenworth scholars to be cursed in return for violating their village. The curse means that the Bergenworth scholars and, eventually, their successors, the Hunters, would be drawn into a Hunter's Nightmare upon death. And it's a pretty perfect curse when you think about it. It's like the Great One is saying, Oh, you like hunting so much? Well, live here forever, and hunt for all eternity, then. Simon tells us that the village is the source of the sin, and implies that we can bring an end to the curse here. So, we do what a hunter does best. We hunt. Ah, sweet child of Kos, returned to the ocean. A bottomless curse, a bottomless sea, accepting of all that there is and can be. When you get back to the Hunter's Dream, the doll will tell you that both she and German sense that they've somehow been freed from their shackles. This happens to the doll and German when you kill Maria and the Orphan, respectively. 
I'm starting to understand how they're connected to these creatures, but it is still really weird that they can sense their counterparts in the nightmare. I'm still trying to figure it out. Hell, I personally haven't even got this dialogue yet, because the doll doesn't give you the dialogue if the dream is on fire, which is annoying. I'll have to play through again so I can show it to you. But so much to talk about here. There's a million other things I want to talk to you guys about. There's even another boss in this DLC that I don't have time to include. But mostly, I really want to talk to you guys about the lore still. This DLC revealed a ton about the timeline, it reveals a lot about how Nightmare Realms work, and it's raised even more questions that I myself haven't answered. It's expanded the stories of German, of Mikolash, of Lawrence, and the doll. And all of those videos will be coming soon, I promise. I could rush the lore stuff out for views, but I do want to do it properly, so thank you for subscribing and waiting, and I reckon it's best to do it right the first time. I also have to thank you guys for supporting this three-part series so well. I didn't think a playthrough would go down so amazingly, but it did, and I really appreciate all the likes and views and the thousands and thousands of comments. I love telling stories and I enjoyed telling my own story about my playthrough and my observations, and it was really cool to read yours in the comments as well. You guys rock. Let's do it again sometime. And also, lastly, a special thanks to all the patrons that support me over on Patreon. You've made it possible for me to do this full time now, and you're incredible, and thank you for changing my life. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers, guys.